Our next speaker is Dr. Kelly Fleming. She's an associate professor of neurology in the cerebrovascular division at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, and she is going to talk to us on cavernous malformations. So please welcome Dr. Fleming. Thank you again. Today I'm going to talk about cavernous malformations. My only disclosure is I will mention a couple of candidate therapeutics that are up and coming for cavernous malformations. And what is a cavernous malformation? Some of you may be familiar, some of you less familiar. It's a type of vascular malformation of the brain and can affect the spinal cord as well. At the very microscopic level, you see endothelial cells that lack the typical tight junction or have a dysfunctional tight junction. Those capillary endothelial cells at the macroscopic level proliferate and form this berry-like structure that you would see on histology. And that translates to what we see on MRI. So these endothelial line caverns can have thrombosis and blood within them as well as calcium. And that translates to what we see on a T2 MRI where you see a reticulated T2 center and a surrounding hemosiderin, the dark spot. So that typical popcorn or raspberry type lesion. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about these. How common are they? Why do they form? A little bit about how do they reach medical attention and what happens to people over time. Talk a little bit about management. How do you manage the symptoms? How do you manage the lesion? And finally end with a little bit on research. So how common are these? These are about one in 200 people have them, but only one in 10 of those will actually have symptoms. They occur in two forms. One is the sporadic form, the most common, and the other is the familial or genetic form. In the sporadic form, you typically see a single lesion, and it's often associated with a developmental venous anomaly. Developmental venous anomalies are congenital and found at birth, whereas we think that uh, cavernous malformations are acquired. Sometimes you'll see multiple cavernous malformations in the sporadic form, but they're usually clustered around a developmental venous anomaly. And here you see at the large arrow, the developmental venous anomaly, and then you see clustered around that are two cavernous malformations. And we think that the developmental venous anomaly leads to the cavernous malformation forming sometime during life. The thoughts are that there's venous hypertension, there's backup of flow, some hypoxia in the local tissue that leads to angiogenesis and this formation of this um, abnormal vascular malformation. Some people have also hypothesized that it's that developmental venous anomaly that may be thrombosis, and then there's a backflow of blood into the cavernous malformation and why these may hemorrhage. 